Doc, I'm about to ask you a series of questions that you're, you are going to want to roll your eyes at, but like I said, I'm an idiot and I need some expertise here. You sit down in a lab and you have a copy of this COVID, Wuhan, whatever you want to call it. You have it. Are you trying to figure out how to vaccinate people against it, how to kill it, how to do both, how to stop it from spreading, and how does one go about that in a dumbed-down sort of way? In the laboratory setting right now, most professionals are working with specimens. A long Q-tip jammed down somebody's throat or up their nose. And they're going to perform a lab test called RNA-PCR. And they're going to look for genetic information in that sample that matches with the COVID virus, the novel coronavirus. So most pathologists right now are very busy uh, performing these tests. And because the CDC has and the FDA have altered their guidelines, we no longer have to wait for one federal source of these tests that many uh, well-equipped hospitals are now preparing on their own because they know how to do it. So this uh, delocalization, this dissemination of, of laboratory technology will greatly increase the number of tests available, but it doesn't mean everybody should take the test. Why shouldn't everybody take the test? Explain. Well, there is a limited number in the millions, true, but there's, you know, 300 million Americans. So here's the people that really should be thinking about going in for testing. First of all, why would you test anyway? Well, it, only if it changed the clinical dynamic. So if you're an at-risk person and you develop flu-like symptoms, but you also develop a high fever, maybe chest pain, a, a severe cough, a breathing problems, confusion due to lack of oxygen or problems like that, then, oh yes, definitely get the test. Anyone who is already hospitalized that has any of these symptoms, regardless of age, they should have the test as well. And the final category are healthcare workers or anybody else taking care of somebody with COVID-19 who may have come into contact within the past 14 days, they should get the test too. But as for healthy people waiting in line, never a good idea, or sitting in their car on a cold day waiting five or six hours for that swab, doesn't really serve a good purpose and it robs access to those tests more deserving of other people. I am hearing, and please feel free to tell me if this is wrong, I am hearing that this virus loves the cold and does not like the heat so much. Is that true for one? And two, why would that be? I don't understand. The answer is yes. The coronaviruses in general, all right, tend to proliferate in the colder weather and dissipate in the warmer weather. Now, the virus itself has nothing to do with it. It's the behavior of the virus. In colder weather, humans are more held closer together. Families stay together in their house. People go to movie theaters. They go to basketball arenas. So it's a seasonal effect of people coming together. First, the summertime, sunshine, plenty of fresh air. People are out water skiing and hiking and running. And, and as you know, movie attendance typically drops except for blockbuster weekends. Fewer people go to the mall in the summer, etc. So it has to deal with the seasonality and the nature of humans to stay close to one another. Can you explain why Italy has been wiped out, at least Northern Italy has been so deeply affected by this? And look, as, as it looks right now, it does not look like we're taking it on the chin like they did. Most people have never been to Northern Italy. They don't understand the differences between their healthcare system and our healthcare system. What did they do wrong? And apparently we did right. Italy's had a head start on the United States uh, through this pandemic. They think it was actually a physician who traveled to Shanghai to attend a medical conference. This is back in January, stayed a few days, didn't feel well, got on the plane with a plane full of people all the way from Shanghai, eventually oh. back to Italy. So you can see what an incubator that was. Now you see the numbers in the media today, 350, 380 deaths in Italy in the past 24 hours from COVID-19. 
Well, that is a disturbing number, but I would suspect that number or more also died from seasonal flu. And the same here in the United States. We have right now on record 41 deaths, but that number will be updated at five o'clock Eastern time. But nonetheless, far more than 41 Americans succumb to seasonal flu. And that's the disease we have a vaccine for. So I would encourage all of your viewers, if they haven't had the flu shot yet, go get it. It protects you from influenza virus, not coronavirus. I, and you're welcome to yell at me about this, I think that some of this stuff that we're doing is over the top. And I understand physicians who want to get a handle on this thing and they want to stop the spread. But when I see the effect this is having on the economy, on businesses for something, I don't want to say it's not bad, but it doesn't appear to, it's not the Black Plague either. Are we going too far, Doc? Can you go too far? You can always go too far, but if you do, six months from now, you'll be laughing about it. If you don't go far enough, then that's a different story. So for that, let's go back to the story in Italy. And because the population uh, is so rural in Northern Italy, that they don't have nearly the health resources that we have in the United States with metropolitan areas, intensive care beds and ventilators. Older folks or anyone who is severely affected by COVID-19 needs to be on a ventilator often, sometimes just for a few days. But if it's not there, then they can't help you. The United States right now certainly has the bandwidth to support a high volume of people that need that aid. Here's why we're practicing the social distancing and the self-quarantining. We're not saying we're gonna pre prevent anybody from getting the disease or reduce the total number of cases. By doing social distancing and self-quarantining, you're flattening the curve so that those cases are more evenly distributed over the next six weeks or so, rather than a horrendous peak, maybe in two weeks or so, when the system would truly be over flooded. We're not changing the end point. Hopefully we're simply changing the destiny. Hey, thanks so much for watching The First on YouTube. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and like and subscribe. You heard me, like it, subscribe. You'll get a lot more of it and a lot more of me.